Welcome to Let's Talk Careers, a talk show for students. And hosted by students. Hi, I'm Helena, a senior at Richard Montgomery High School. And I'm Nick, your smob and also a senior at Richard Montgomery High School. We're delighted to introduce our career guests for today, leaders from the world of engineering. Welcome to Let's Talk Careers. Please let me introduce you to our first guest, Dr. Melissa Rhodes. Dr. Rhodes is a project engineer principal and biotechnology advocate at Lockheed Martin and leads a portfolio in research and development. Dr. Rhodes has nearly 20 years of experience in various systems engineering roles for the Department of Defense and government research customers. Welcome to our show today. Thank you, happy to be here. Next up is Ms. Fenidra Wiggum, a project manager for Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, WSSC. Ms. Wiggum specializes in water utility programs focusing on environmentally sensitive areas, pipeline analysis, and critical wastewater condition assessment. In this evolving landscape of environmental, regulatory, and technological developments, she uses analytics and innovation to continually improve our watershed. Thank you and welcome to the show. Our next guest is Mr. Joe Batwinis, a graduate from the APEX program at Walter Johnson High School right here at MCPS. He has worked at Northrop Grumman supporting the B2 Spirit Stealth Bomber in various research and development efforts. He currently works as a fuel system responsible engineer. Thank you for joining this panel. Hey, good morning. And last but not least, our final guest is Ms. Jessica Rosenthal, a vehicle controls test and integration engineer at Rivian, an automotive startup. Rivian is currently working to build an all electric truck and SUV. Ms. Rosenthal loved taking STEM classes at her middle school and she participated in the project Lead the Way program at her high school. Welcome to the show. Hi guys, thanks for having me. Thank you all for being here today. The show is coming to you live via YouTube by the way of Zoom. The show is designed to let students learn about different career paths and to hear the journeys of successful men and women like the speakers with us today. Students are submitting questions live via our YouTube chat and have also sent in questions prior to today's show to ask our guests. We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can. So we're really excited to get to learn more about your careers and about engineering. So let's dive right in. First off, we'd love to get to know a little bit more about you. You know, where did you grow up? What college or university did you attend? Um, Melissa, let's start with you. I grew up outside Philly. I went to Bucknell for undergrad, uh, and then I'm, I got a couple of grad degrees at Penn and Arizona State and got my PhD at the University of Maryland. That's awesome, thank you. Vinidra? No worries. Uh, Joe, what about you? Yeah, so as, as you mentioned in my intro, uh, I'm an MCPS kid. I grew up in Rockville, Maryland. I went to Farmland Elementary, Tilden Middle School, and uh, Walter Johnson High School in Bethesda. And then I went on to The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio for my bachelor's in aerospace engineering. That's great. Jessica? Yeah, I grew up in uh, Severna Park, Maryland, and I ended up going to the University of Maryland and studied mechanical engineering. And now I'm in California. Awesome. Benidra, let's pass it back to you. Nick, you can take the next question. All right. So as you know, as you kind of think about your life after those initial stages of getting that training, internship, college, all of that, and as you've moved into your career, what's been your favorite job and why? Um, Vinidra, let's start off with you. Okay. Um, so, so far, the favorite my favorite job was the one I had when I came originally out, out of college. I think for engineers, it is your first job is maybe your more memorable job because you learn so much. You get a chance to work with so many others in the field and you're kind of fresh faced and, you know, ready to learn and absorb more. So and working as an environmental engineer, actually in the Rockfield area was my favorite part of my original job. That's great, Joe. Yeah, my uh, my current job, I'm actually pretty lucky, is, has kind of turned into the dream job I, I wanted even when I was in middle school. So that's been that's been pretty great uh, work for Northrop now. Um, I've had some some other jobs here and there, um, but I've ended up back at back at this job, and it's been it's been pretty fun. That's awesome, Melissa. 
Um, I've had a lot of jobs with the same company, uh, but I think my favorite ones were where we were delivering a product directly to the customer and I got to work with the team um, some late nights, um, but there's nothing better than seeing something work at the end of the day. For sure. And Jessica? Yeah, my internet works. Sorry about that, guys. Um, this is what's my favorite job. What's yep. been my favorite job? Awesome. Yeah, I, um, I'm i pretty biased. I'm fresh out of school, so this is my first and only job. Uh, but this job is pretty fun. I'm on my feet all day, and I'm working with the prototype vehicles here at Rivian. So, uh, yeah, I'd say my job at Rivian. Great. Thank you so much. And um, our next question is that we know that engineering is such a diverse field. So can you name a few of the fields in engineering? And we can start this one with Joe. Uh, sure. So obviously my, my background is aerospace engineering or aeronautical engineering. Um, we also, in aerospace, we have uh, mechanical engineers and electrical engineers uh, on, our, on our team. Great. Melissa? Uh, communications engineers and RF engineers, computer science engineers, and cybersecurity engineers are things I work with every day. Thank you. Jessica? Yeah, there's uh, materials engineering and robotics, and then the industry that I'm in now, so automotive uh, engineering. Great. And Vanidra? Um, so for me, I work daily and closely with construction engineers and geotechnical engineers, um, as well as additional persons that are involved in environmental engineering. Great. I think we covered a very wide variety of fields, but um, could each of you describe specifically what your specialty is and why you chose that path? And we can start this one with Melissa. Um, so my specialty at this point is probably systems engineering. I have a background in electrical and telecom, but I really work with a lot of different engineers and try to pull things together into a large system uh, to make it work. Uh, I also have a bioengineering degree, and I use that uh, to think about how we can make materials uh, with biology. Thank you. Joe? So my, my, my degree is aerospace engineering. So aerospace engineering is generally speaking the, the flow of fluids around objects. So that applies to making airplanes. Um, it also applies to making boats because um, water is a fluid. Uh, and so anything, anything related to airplanes or, or even cars, cars move through the air. So that's all aerospace engineering. Thank you. Benidra? And so like Joe works with fluids, I also work with fluids, but in a different capacity. I My specialty is wastewater, um, and that's the water that's been used and discharged it could, into a sewer system. It could be discharged from your home, from your business, um, from a factory, from a farm. And so basically uh, the pipelines that that fluid flows through comes in many sizes and shapes. And I analyze and investigate problems in those pipelines and find solutions um, so that they can keep working and keep flowing. Great. And finally, Jessica. Yeah, I, uh, I think I chose automotive engineering. One, it's just awesome to work on cars, um, especially cars that can go really fast and, uh, and are pretty innovative. But um, yeah, the automotive industry in general, I think you have to kind of know a lot, like what Joe was saying, like, uh, automotive industry, you have to know a little bit about aerodynamics and a little bit about mechanical engineering and a little bit about electrical engineering and um, communication. So uh, yeah, automotive engineering, I think like really ties together a lot of different fields. So that's, that's kind of why I like it. So, you know, as we've discussed, there's so many uh, professions of engineering in my head, the way I kind of see engineering is it's a field of creation, regardless of what specialty you have as an engineer, you're creating something, but can you move across to different specialties and, you know, have you guys had experience doing that? Um, Melissa, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I certainly have. Um, I again, started as electrical engineer, ended up as a bioengineer. Uh, it, it is kind of a way and a method of thinking is what my professors always told me in undergrad. You learn how to learn, uh, you apply principles across a wide variety. Um, so, you know, you kind of get a basis and then you can jump to different engineering fields from there, um, especially as you go throughout your career. It's awesome. Does anyone else have anything else to add or does anyone else have experience kind of shifting between specialties? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
Melissa made a really good uh, line there. You learn how to learn. That's that's kind of that's something that's come up a lot. Is you know, being an engineer, you don't necessarily know everything, but you know how to find out about what you need to find out about. Um, you know how to learn about it. Um, but and certainly within you know aerospace engineering, if you're working on an airplane, there's lots to do, and it's not all just aerodynamics. So there's all different disciplines of engineering that go into building an airplane. Uh, and so you don't necessarily just focus in on one thing. You might have to do a, a bunch of different jobs. So I'm not really doing an aerodynamics job, but I'm an aerospace engineer. That's great that you get to explore those different skills. And I guess, so our next question is, you know, what skills and abilities are most important in the current position you have in the uh, engineering industry? Uh, Vanidra, let's start with you. I believe that the skill that surprised me the most as I continue through my career is the amount of communication that's required. It's important to be able to communicate highly technical things to non-technical people from time to time. So the way you communicate is important. That definitely makes sense. And how about you, Joe? You were kind of touching on this question a little bit too earlier. Yeah, I mean, obviously the technical skills are, are important, but uh, like Benidra said, uh, presentation skills. I was actually having a com conversation about this the other day uh, in the office with with my colleagues. Uh, the number of presentations that you end up giving on like a weekly basis is far higher than I would have expected in, in high school when I certainly hated the, the, the presentation assignments in school, uh, standing in front of the class telling people about stuff. But Ultimately, eventually, you're going to get to a job where you're talking to your customers. They might be, you know, government people. They might be generals in the military. Uh, you know, uh, big important people or vice presidents at your company. So, having really good uh, presentation skills and being able to clearly explain the technical stuff that you're working on. So it's one thing to be really good and technical, uh, but it's another thing to be able to actually explain those those concepts to the people who are going to make decisions about it. Great, thank you so much. Our next question is directed at Jessica. So the company you work for, Rivian, launched the world's first electric adventure vehicles, reimagining pickups and SUVs. So what it, what is it like being a part of such an innovative company? Uh, it's awesome, yeah. I uh, The people that work here are amazing, like everybody um, everybody's really excited about the product. So, um, it's really fun to work on a team where everyone's pumped that you're working on this really cool, innovative truck. Um, yeah, so I, I get to come in to work every day feeling really motivated and, and excited to work. Um, which I don't think that a lot of people can say, but, um, yeah, this job like totally pumps me up and energizes me, which is, which is good. That's amazing. It's nice to work in such a high energy environment where everyone is just as passionate. Um, our next question is directed at Melissa. So you have been at Lockheed Martin for 18 years and you've had the opportunity to experience new positions and projects. So what has been your favorite project or position or one that has influenced your career the most? Um, I think uh, some combination of my current role and my last role where I get to lead a team of people doing research and development, and I've had the ability to advocate uh, for biotech at Lockheed Martin, uh, where we're looking at new ways of making materials and new materials that we can use in our products. Um, it's something I'm passionate about. I can relate to Jessica's answer. Uh, we're making things more sustainably. We're not using petrochemical. Um, so I think it's it's that working and leading teams uh, that are doing some really interesting research uh, definitely makes it fun to get up in the morning and figure out what we're going to discover that day. Great. And just as a follow-up question, how important was it to you to find a company with mobility? That was huge. I remember graduating and thinking, I don't, I can't commit to one desk for the rest of my life. Uh, so going into a company that started me out in a rotational program and then being able to be within the same corporation, but having worked across four different major businesses uh, has been just phenomenal. I have a great network um, and I see things kind of at a different perspective. Um, and I kind of get to move and to do whatever I would like to do. So ships to, to space, to submarines. Great, and opening it up to the other panelists, has mobility in a job been a priority for you? 
and anyone can take them. Uh, certainly working at a big company, it's it's been a benefit. Um, similar to Melissa, I've had uh, a handful of different jobs within uh, Northrop Grumman. Uh, I've worked uh, in Los Angeles. I've worked uh, up in the desert where I am now. I've worked down in uh, Florida. Um, so I've, I've worked in a bunch of different places on a bunch of different stuff, um, doing different jobs, uh, structural engineering, repairs, uh, the, the fluids, the fuel job I'm in now. So it's been it's been nice being able to move around and see different stuff and working for a big company certainly allows for that kind of mobility, which is which is nice. And speaking of, you know, that lots of experience and um, that long career, Vinidra, you've been a civil engineer for over 10 years. You mentioned this already briefly, but um, has there been anything else that have surprised you over the years in your career? Yeah, I think what's been the most surprising is probably how amazing it is that some of the structures that we see every day or that we use every day were possibly built 60, 70, 80 years ago. I work, like I mentioned, with pipelines, and some of these pipes have been in the ground for so long. And so um, in my case, it's important for me to make sure they're functioning well, they're standing up to the test of time, but they're aging as well. And so that's why um, I have a I think that it's important for us to have those engineers around to d develop and design the next set of structures or the next set of pipelines that will go in to replace these that are aging. Because you hear the term infrastructure thrown around a lot um, in this area, and that's a part of your infrastructure. And some of it's been around for a long time. So that's been surprising for me. That's cool that you're developing those new systems for the for the future. And you know, um, for you, Joe, as a CPS graduate, was there something or someone during your time in high school or in with MCPS that really helped inform your career path? Yeah, I, I had a few really good teachers over the years. Uh, my my sixth grade science teacher, Miss Chen, got me into the robotics program that lasted throughout uh, middle school and high school. I did that, um, and that really kind of set me up on a trajectory for. Uh, engineering. I had a really great physics teacher in high school, Miss Ott, uh, who was awesome, and a great tech ed teacher, Mr. Hardy um, at WJ. Uh, they were both really great and kind of helped me along on that engineering path. Um, yeah. Moving along to advice specifically for our audience, um, what can students do now to get an introduction to engineering? And we can start with Vinitra. I think now um, students should just lean in and engage, engage in your science classes, engage in your math classes, you know, listen to your counselors and ask questions, ask questions, just like Joe said, um, you know, you have to be able to communicate and this will be a good time to start wondering what's going on in the world and understanding what you like. Um, I liked, food. So that's why part of my major was agricultural engineering. So um, I figured everyone has to eat. I like to eat. So, you know, find out what you like and what you can do and, and, and expand upon what you like. Thank you. Jessica? Yeah, I, um, uh, I'm sorry, can you remind me of the question? I kind of cut out of it. Yeah, of course. Um, what can students do now to get an introduction to engineering? Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'd say if your parents say it's okay uh, to find some maybe old old things in your house that you're allowed to take apart. Um, I know I took a couple of uh, old printers um, and old TV remotes apart. Um, some of them, my mom got pretty mad at me, but um, yeah, I'd say ask your parents if there's stuff around your house that maybe you could tinker around with and try to figure out how how those systems work. Um, yeah, that was a pretty good way of, of getting me into kind of like exploring uh, how things work. Yeah, curiosity seems to be a very big part of engineering. Um, Melissa? Yeah, I'd agree. I think anything you can touch and kind of learn and figure out yourself is terrific. I just, YouTube is such an amazing resource. There's some great YouTubers out there that um, teach really good engineering. I think Smarter Every Day and Physics Girl, and I think most people know Mark Roper, um, are great representatives of engineers that are doing cool things. Um, so yeah, you're on YouTube already. That's great. 
Thank you. And yeah, you're right. YouTube is such a wonderful resource. And I feel very fortunate to have grown up in the age of technology and have all that technology right at my fingertips. And finally, Joe. Uh, yeah, uh, YouTube's awesome these days. Uh, Engineering Explained is another really good one. Um, uh, for for people that are still in school, I'd say look around and see what uh, extracurriculars might be available to you at, at your school. Um, like I said, I did, I did robotics uh, when I was in school, uh, but I also did stage crew. So with the theater department, so not in front of the, in front of the, uh, the screen, but uh, behind, behind the stage, uh, building the sets and working on the lighting systems and setting up the sound. Um, so it, all of that, get, you get to learn a lot about how, how stuff works and building stuff. Uh, so that was a, another great experience. That, so even if there's probably a, a, something like that in your school. And if there's not, you know, talk to talk to your teachers and see what there might be available to you. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, I actually do sound for my school's theater department and um, it is really so technical and you can learn so much about engineering from, from those kinds of things. And yeah, I highly encourage anyone interested to check that out. Definitely. We've We've received a question from YouTube, actually. A student asked, how often would you say that you use math in your career and what type of math? And we can start again with Vanidra. Um, I'd say that I use math daily. Um, and the type, for the most part, that I'm using is geometry and algebra. For geometry, I have to know the size of pipes, so pipeline diameters um, matter to me. Um, the slope of the pipe matters to me because sewer water should flow on gravity usually. And so those are some of the things that um, I use daily. Actually, calculus is actually important. I know you said some people say you don't use F math every day, but calculus is important to you to build models, um, right? If you're going to build a new house or a new school, I need to model um, the system to predict uh, how much flow from that school or from that home, you know, will come into these pipes that I've mentioned multiple times that are aging and they're getting older and they've been in the pipes for 60 or 70 years and you just want to make sure you have capacity. So um, calculus helps me model and geometry helps me understand flows. Great. Thank you for mentioning that. I know that in the classroom, it can all feel very abstract, but it's, it's nice to see that there are real concrete, important applications. Melissa? Yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of calculus. I know it can be tough. I got a C on my first calc test in high school and I muscled through. Um, and it's it's just hugely important. So a uh, big fan of calculus and also just math tools in general. Um, so Excel does some basic stuff and you'll get exposed to MATLAB and other tools. The more you understand the tools you can use to do math, um, I think the more successful you'll be. Thank you, Joe. Uh, yeah, another bump for the for the tools. If you, uh, eventually, you'll get into to MATLAB, and MATLAB's huge. Uh, so if you're good at MATLAB, that's that's excellent. <laughs> you'll be everybody's favorite person. Uh, certainly, certainly, uh, as far as what I use, mostly it's more on just uh, maybe algebra, the algebra side. Is about as far as I need in my daily job. But certainly, other people in the office uh, they're doing calculus on a daily basis. If you're worried about keeping an airplane stable in the air and how it, how it flies. Uh, that's all, that's all calculus. Thank you. And Jessica. Yeah, I'd say, uh, I mean, all, all of those things are pretty important. Um, and I think the main thing that I use day to day, not even really a, like a specific field of math, um, but just relationships, knowing, um, how things mathematically are, are interrelated. So, if one thing that I'm looking at is increasing, what will that have to do to the rest of um, my system? And if something was a big equation, kind of like how you look at different variables and how they um, how they change in a system. So that's kind of how I'm using math. Um, yeah, and, and more of like uh, using that as a tool and kind of analytically thinking about a problem. I'm sure the the students watching will be glad to know that they get to use math after after high school. And it seems that you guys are using math in different projects and in different aspects of your career. So, you know, what has been the most challenging project that you guys have worked on? Uh, Joe, let's start with you. 
Uh, so one of the nice things is in my current job, stuff stuff comes up all the time. It's there's always something different. That's a different challenge, and and usually the biggest challenges are when, when things break. Um, you know, so to use a a more a more public example, uh, everybody probably saw the uh, the airliner, the seven seven seven, out of Denver the other like a week or two ago that had the uh, the engine kind of explode on its wing. Um, so when stuff like that happens, the engineering team has to get spooled up and say like, okay, well, that was bad. Uh, why did that happen? Um, and what do we need to do to make sure that doesn't happen again? So you have to go investigate, you know, you might not have all the information you want to have. Like I don't have a video recording of the fan blade that fell apart. Right. But uh, I can look at the evidence that I do have left and try and piece together what happened. And then I have to piece together why that happened uh, and then figure out the plan to make sure it doesn't happen again. So that kind of exercise um, comes up all the time. And those challenges are what keep things interesting and fun. Sure. That sounds like a lot of fun having to problem solve on your feet like that. Uh, Jessica. Yeah, I'd say probably one of my uh, toughest, but coolest projects, I guess, uh, not really one single project, but kind of like coming into this company and really not knowing anything about the inner workings of the car. Um, I, I work specifically on the thermal system. So um, getting in and knowing absolutely nothing and then having to kind of become an expert on the control strategy and on um, on the plumbing of the car, uh, that's been a pretty cool project um, just because I really didn't know anything about it before. And I think now I've worked at the company for like nine months, and I think nine months later I, I've become somewhat of an expert in that system, which is really cool. It does sound like a cool project, and as you guys mentioned, learning seems to be a constant part of your job, having to learn new systems and new parts of engineering. Um, Melissa, what about you? Um, I think at this point, uh, the hardest thing I did was go back to get my PhD 10 plus years after graduating. Um, it is really hard to take tests. Uh, I didn't do well on my math class when I came back. Um, and that's because when you're in a big company, even if you're not the expert, you can usually find out who the expert is. So solving the tough technical problems has not been the biggest challenge. Um, it's finding the right people that that have the knowledge and then pulling that into whatever your current challenge is. Um, lucky to be with be part of a big company so that I get to kind of leverage years of experience from a lot of other people. I'm sure that's comforting for a lot of our audience, knowing that you'll have other people there to learn from and to get to work with um, when you can't solve a problem. And um, how about you, Vanidra? Yeah, I kind of want to mirror something that Joe said. Um, recently, we've seen uh, not just a plane disaster, but we also saw a water crisis or so a water disaster kind of play out in a southern state. And so, you know, in this area, the water company that I work for services Prince George's County and Montgomery County in Maryland. And so, you know, we're constantly going back to the drawing board and taking a look at our systems to say, you know, that something happened, if that could that happen here, what can we do to avoid that happening here? And how can we make sure that our pipelines and our um, connections and everything, you know, works and will continue to work even in the face of a disaster or weather related incident or, you know, the climate changes or something like that. So I think that that's a part of it is asking the question, could that happen here? And if so, what does it look like? And can we do something to hedge that problem off? So, yeah, so it seems like you guys are constantly thinking on your feet and each day is a, is a new project, a new adventure, a new problem that you guys have to solve. And that's actually really cool that your job is constantly, you know, it's very active like that. And you get to try new things every day. And so, you know, for M Melissa, for you as someone who works in biotechnology, what does your day to day look like? A biotech is a small part of my day, um, but especially a new field that we're just starting to explore. Um, you know, I couldn't major in bioengineering when I went to school. It didn't exist. I was an electrical engineer with a biochem minor. Um, but we're looking at, you know, how the new technology can affect us and understanding when it will actually be ready uh, for uh kind of integration into a large system. So there's lots of exciting things happening in biotech, right? We've got lab grown meat and vegan proteins coming out all over. And I get to say, stay on top of that space. There's people growing bricks and um, 
growing fungus for uh, structures. Uh, and we're looking at all that. Um, but, you know, working in the defense industry, we have very strict requirements for how things have to operate. Um, so uh, having the technology get to the level where we're comfortable incorporating it into our products due to the uh, safety requirements we have um, is going to be a little bit. And just figuring out how that will work uh, is one of my biggest challenges right now. Yeah, it's really cool that you mentioned um, plant-based meats because I've been vegan for the past few years. So it's been really cool to see the evolution of the availability of all these substitutes. And um, yeah, thank you to all the scientists who are behind that. Um, our next question is for Venidra. So WSSC is a really large company. Um, which departments do you interact with most in your role? Um, so my role is very investigative. So I interact with a lot of the technicians and a lot of the construction side because when I do an investigation, um, my results alternatively go to someone else to make the design. So um, I may find the problem, but somebody else may, I may find the problem and make a recommendation on a solution, but someone else may design that solution. So I think that the great thing about working in a large company is you get a chance to s interact with so many departments and understand, I think understanding your role and where you fit in the puzzle is really important um, and how the work you do influences the next thing. So if I find a problem um, I if and I know how to solve it, it's important for me to just be able to pass it along, pass the baton to the next person or pass the baton to the next department. Um, and I have to be able to set the right parameters. And, you know, we're a large water utility. It's important that everything that I do, I know that I'm serving the community and the customer. So I'm not only interacting with different departments, I get in interact with the public and my customers, because when you wake up in the morning, you expect for the water to come out the faucet and our pipes are out of sight, out of mind. So you never, usually you never think about where it goes after I, you know, do my business or flush or wash my dishes or wash my hands. And so I think, um, right now it's a laser focus on, you know, water and washing your hands and stuff. So I think it's important to know that the public is a part of how I move and how I operate as well um, as I interact with the departments internally. Thank you for that insight. Um, I didn't realize coming into this how important collaboration is in engineering, so that's really wonderful to hear. The next question is for Joe. Um, you served as a judge for the 2020 AeroConnect Challenge, so how do you see contests as a way to enhance student learning? Yeah, so um, so the AeroConnect Challenge is a, uh, a competition sponsored by the by SAE International, which is a, a professional society for engineers. Um, I actually helped them develop the AeroConnect Challenge. It was a, developing a, that one was for developing a or designing a UAV that would help fight f wildfires out here in California. Um, and then we're actually in the middle of the the 2021 challenge now, um, and. Uh, they're really great. So I did I did another one in college called Baja SAE. Uh, there's another where you build a little off-road buggy. Uh, there's one called FSAE, Formula SAE, where you build a little uh, street race car. Um, all of these projects, uh, and, there's, and there's a bunch of them out there, are really great for college students to, to get into uh, while they're in school to give you a little bit of extracurricular learning opportunity um, to actually go and take the skills that you're learning in the classroom and apply them to a an actual project where you actually have to design and, and build something to meet a, a set of requirements that have been uh, given to you. Um, and you you learn a ton by doing that because you know you it's all uh, mostly it's theoretical in the classroom um, and being able to actually apply the skills that you're learning in class um, to build something and then have that thing that you built uh, probably break. Um, and then learn from how it broke and how to fix it. Um, you learn a ton by doing that. So competitions like like that um, are extremely beneficial. Um, and so if you're if you're in college for engineering, I, I'd strongly encourage you to to look for those things because beyond just the stuff you're learn just learning from it, um, it's a great thing to have on a resume for employers to see because they can see that 
not only did you learn extra while you were in college from these projects, uh, it also shows you have the the time management skills to balance doing a big project like that and uh, all your coursework. So uh, that kind of stuff is is really really beneficial. Thank you. And I know you mentioned some of the contests that you're aware of, but do any of the other panelists have recommendations for contests that students in our audience should be on, on the lookout for? Yeah, well, just to piggyback off of what Joe said, um, yeah, I participated in the formula essay um, when I was in college. Uh, that was awesome. It was like a group of nerds making a race car, which was just like my cup of tea. So. Um, that was very fun. And then in high school, I also did uh, the Technology Student Association. So there were a bunch of like little projects within there, but um, one of the big ones was uh, a robotics or VEX competition. Um, and that was, I actually didn't participate in the VEX competition, but um, that was a really good way of getting exposure to some mechanics and some robotics and electromechanical systems. And if you're interested in biotech, uh, there's a group called iGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. It's kind of modeled after FIRST Robotics, and they've got high school students up through postgrads, and a lot of the people out of there have started some of the biggest companies in biotech. So if you've heard of Ginkgo Bioworks um, and some other companies, uh, they're out of iGEM. So it's a similar competition. And speaking of contest and, you know, those experiences that get you the chance to um, get exposed to different fields, you guys mentioned robotics earlier. Um, you know, what are some of those engineering careers that involve robotics, especially for our students watching who are a part of the robotics team in their high school? Um, Joe, you mentioned robotics. Could you elaborate on some of those fields? Sure. Um, so certainly in aerospace engineering, we use robotics to build airplanes. Um, you know, building an airplane is very touch labor intensive um, and repetitive labor intensive. So you might have thousands of fasteners uh, along the side of an airplane that need to have every single hole has to get drilled and it has to get drilled perfectly. Um, you can let a person do that, but they're probably going to mess it up fairly often. And then you have to go fix that. Or you can have a robot do it. Uh, and the robot will pretty much do it exactly the same way, exactly perfectly, every single time, fastener after fastener. Uh, so we use lots of robots in uh, assembling airplanes, also in moving moving airplanes around our factory. Um, we have a production line where every every airplane is on its own little moving robot, and so when it's time for it to move from one station to the next during the assembly build. Uh, the robot just comes and picks it up and just takes it uh, autonomously from one station to the next uh, and just moves it around the factory. So, And then, of course, uh, UAVs are becoming more and more prevalent in the world, so the airplanes themselves are turning into robots, right, or are robots. Uh, they can basically fly themselves. So robotics is, is huge in, in aerospace. And we do have underwater unmanned vehicles too, right? So they're the surface vehicles underwater. And um, I would also say space, obviously we're seeing Mars Rover right now out there. That's a lot of robotics and a lot of what happens in space is all autonomous, so. Yeah, and the new Mars Rover even has a robotic helicopter attached to the Rover, mm -hmm. which is pretty awesome. Don't say anyone, I think. Go ahead, Vinidra. Yeah, I don't think I connected uh, enough of the dots when it came to robotics as well. Um, so it's great to hear how uh, you all have just expounded upon how it's used in a lot of things that we're seeing every day. I've recently uh, been super duper interested in drones and because I've mentioned my pipelines are out of sight, out of mind, I also need to know what the effects of the environment are doing um, in some of the areas that my pipelines are. So like, I even have my little drone that I practice on here. Um, I got my certification and everything. So if you liked that kind of, those kinds of things um, and playing around and um, I wasn't that good at using a joystick and playing video games and stuff, but it's important to, to just see what else is out there and what you can do with those kind of robotics. I don't think I connected the unmanned aerial um, vehicles and systems and stuff, but that's a really good, those are really good topics. Yeah, and I think I, I, I was saying, just, you know, 
there. So the way is, uh, of courses that I, I or I guess a program that I participated in in high school, um, and I took some introductory engineering classes. Um, so it allowed me to uh, experiment a bit with what uh, what types of engineering are out there. Like I started to learn about kind of the fundamentals of engineering, um, and. After taking those classes, I was like, oh, I'm into this. This is super cool. Like, I took some digital electronics classes that I loved um, and some basic mechanics, stuff like that. Um, so that program really exposed me to what is it like to kind of take a pseudo engineering class. Um, yeah, also, you're just in the classes of a bunch of other people who also really like the technology and really like engineering. So, um, yeah, it's pretty fun. It was, it was a great program. That's great that you're in that environment of other like-minded students who are also interested in the field of engineering, that you got to take those classes. And um, I know we discussed math, but that we compete with a school in Harbor, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and they also offered a drafting class, which is really more like an architecture class, but it got, uh, it let us learn how to use AutoCAD, uh, which was my first experience with a, a computer-aided design program, a CAD program, um, which is basically how we do everything in engineering, uh, or at least in, in my field. Um, in more three-dimensional uh, CAD programs. AutoCAD is a, a two-dimensional, so it's all uh, flat drawings, but that was pretty great getting an exposure to, to CAD systems in high school. Thank you. And I know we've already discussed contests and um, robotics teams and stage crew for drama clubs, but what are some other extracurricular activities where students can get a chance to engage in the environment engineers work in? Anyone can take that question. For me, I was a Girl Scout. And so I think that uh, deepened my appreciation for the environment. And I think that's kind of why um, I gravitated more toward an environmental realm and the and understanding the resources that we have, because it kind of teaches you to understand that we only have one earth. And unless technology advances some more, we probably will continue to stay here uh, unless we move to Mars or something like that. But I don't know if that's going to happen um, during my lifetime. But for now, we only have one Earth. And so um, it helped me know that I'm here and I really want to protect it. And so uh, Girl Scouts was a big part of that for me. Yeah, I'm going to go a little bit off kilter here. Um, I was an athlete in high school. I played D1 sports in college. Um, having that balance and outlet for me was really important. Um, so I think, you know, your mental and your physical health also goes along together. So, um, you know, it's okay to do non-engineering things um, in your extracurriculars too. I would be the only other thing I'd say. Something I wanted to mention was... Uh... Also, some companies do offer internships for high school students as well. Uh, so not just for, for college students. Um, I know my company does, uh, and I'm sure plenty of others 
do as well. So um, that's something to, if you're really interested in it, it's something to look at, look out for. Yeah, there's a lot of DOD labs in the area. I know um, Carter Rock has internships for high school students. Um, I took the robotics team I coached at Carter Rock. Um, so the U.S. government being here in D.C. Metro, you've got a lot of opportunities around for high school internships and shadowing. Great. Thank you. And the next question we've actually received from YouTube. Um, what would you say is the most rewarding thing about being an engineer? And we can start off with Jessica. Um, that's a great question. I think uh, working really hard on a project and then seeing that project actually work is like the most rewarding thing in the world. Um, if you've worked, I mean, in my field, like if you work on a specific feature of a car and you actually see that feature working on the car, it's like nuts. The fact that you've put in so much time and worked with so many people um, and like really dedicated yourself to a project and then actually seeing that project work um, and seeing even other people on different teams interact with your, your specific product or if it's a consumer product, like seeing customers actually interact um, with what you've worked on is like, it's the coolest feeling. Thank you. Oh. oh, sorry. Sorry, Melissa, you can go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, and for me, I knew I needed a job right out of undergrad and I knew that I could get a job if I was an engineer. So, you know, as, aside from solving problems and being curious and getting to learn every day, knowing that it's stable career and, and I can do the other things in my life um, and being in demand also kind of feels really good. I'm happy to piggyback on what Melissa says. Um, being in demand as an engineer is a plus. And I think for now, for me, it's definitely humbling to know uh, the impact that you're having. I mean, this is, I work with water and sewer every day. Um, and again, we keep, I keep saying it's out of sight, out of mind. Those are some of the things that are pretty much, they're kind of precious right now. So um, I think having a transferable skill set, knowing that I learned how to learn in college, because that's what some of your engineering programs prepare you to do is learn how to learn. Um, and then being able to cross and transfer those skills and abilities um, to other places. I think it's just, it's rewarding to know that your mind may work a little different and so you can think through things, different steps, a couple steps ahead, um, like take th taking things apart, like Jessica mentioned, it's cool to know that um, it kind of feels like you have an engineering brain, you know? And I don't know if the rest of the panelists can relate to this, but I'm like, my engineering mind thinks like this and it tells me this. And so um, it's, a, if a, it's a different way of looking at it. And for me in the water, on, on the water and wastewater sector, it's really humbling to work. Thank you. And Joe? Yeah, for me, uh, similar to Jessica is, is seeing the, the whole progression of, of a project. Uh, I've always been a, a huge airplane nerd. I've always loved airplanes. I'm the kid who always looked up when an airplane flew over. Um, and so seeing, you know, seeing something that you're working on in on the computer uh, go from something on the computer to something on the shop floor being built to watching something take off on the runway and then fly over your head, uh, it's pretty awesome. So that, that's always been super rewarding. It was great listening to your responses. I think for a lot of people, um, you know, seeing a career like engineering where you kind of start off with something in your head and then it turns into a reality, I think is going to be a lot, is something that they're, they'd be happy to hear, you know, exist. Because I feel like a lot of jobs, you don't get that um, real validation of seeing all the things that you wanted to create come into, re, um, become a reality. So I think that's really cool that you guys get to do that. And also, I'm just um, uh, curious, Melissa, you kind of mentioned this earlier, but what sport did you play in college? I played field hockey. Oh, that's cool. Um, and so I guess shifting gears kind of to, you know, the fact that you guys have had the chance to explore your own fields and you guys have talked about constantly learning and constantly um, getting to explore different fields. Is there an engineering topic that you'd like to explore, but you guys haven't had the chance to do so yet? Um, Joe, why don't we start with you? Um, honestly, like I said, like I mentioned, I kind of fell into the job I always wanted. Um, so that's that's been pretty great. I didn't have to like work too hard to like make my way there. I, I kind of had a target in mind even all the way back in middle school. 
uh, and just kind of on track minded my way there. Uh, so that's been pretty great. Awesome. And you, Vinidra? Um, for me, I think we're looking into um, bioprocessing when it comes to our wastewater treatment plant. So maybe some bioengineering maybe in my future, some um, understanding what else I can do with poo because that's pretty much what I work for every day. So like just trying to see uh, maybe focusing on the energy sector as it relates to that as well for the, as a bio, as bioenergy. That's cool for sure. And thank you for, for doing that work. Uh, Melissa. Yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate. I'm super passionate about biotech and where bioengineering is going to take us. Um, and I do get to dabble in that. Um, so just doing more of that in the future. That's awesome. And Jessica? Yeah, we've had some uh, recent projects come up. I, I took one machine learning uh, class in, in college, and it kind of gave me a surface level understanding of machine learning. But um, yeah, we've had a couple problems come up with the car that um, I think machine learning would be super applicable. So um, it's something that I've like dug up my old textbook and have uh, tried to kind of brush up on that because um, I think that that's something that uh, could be pretty useful in the automotive industry, especially in diagnostics. So um, yeah, that's something that I, I want to want to be better at and want to want to start applying to my uh, everyday life. It's cool that you guys got the chance to expand your knowledge that you already have, the, the extensive knowledge that you guys already have. It's cool that you guys get to expand that. And um, we're getting a question from YouTube, uh, perfect for Women's History Month, but um, what advice do you guys have for women who are especially interested in pursuing a career in STEM? Um, Jessica, why don't we start with you? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I work in an industry that's especially uh, uh, doesn't have great ratios in the automotive industry uh, in terms of uh, gender diversity. Uh, so, yeah, I think part of it is just like being uh, confident and uh, and understanding that you've been through the same classes that all the guys in the shop have also been through, um, and that you have a unique perspective and uh, a unique way of of solving problems. So, uh, I guess not getting too discouraged if, if you don't see a ton of other women um, in the room with you and knowing that you kind of, you've been through the same stuff. You've been through all the same technical um, uh, coursework at, at, as all the other guys in the room. So being confident and uh, yeah, you belong there, even if it doesn't look like uh, there are a ton of other women there. For sure. That's definitely a great reminder and great advice. I'm Melissa. Yeah, I'm not sure I could say it better than Jessica. Um, just continue to build your confidence if it's building things, um, if it's competing on team or competing um, in, in the engineering competitions. Um, there's, you know, electrical engineering, I think there was 20% and that was high. Um, but yeah, it's, you find the other women in it too and, and you work together and, and you realize that, yeah, you can do it too. It's awesome that you have that team of people who are supporting you and have been through those same struggles and deal with those same problems. Um, Vinidra? Yeah, um, engineering historically is pretty much a male-dominated field, and even in college, it's a male-dominated um, kind of curriculum for sometimes. When you look around the room in your college classes, you may not see people that um, look like you. And I think that uh, I think you have to kind of find your voice and speak up, uh, join teams and know that your input is important and um, take the hard classes, just like Jessica said, you've been through the same hard classes that, you know, the rest of the guys have been through. And um, I have to echo both of the ladies with the confidence, you know, you belong there, you deserve to be there. And um, when you get there, if you see another, um, another young lady or another female that's interested in the same things, you know, be able to reach back and help um, and encourage because we're needed in our voices and our, our opinions are very important um, in the future um, coming in. Then, um, you know, you don't want a world that's designed with just one point of view or one perspective. So, interview and everyone's perspective matter no matter um how old you are what color you are so 
Thank you all for that. And it's wonderful to have such great representation on our panel today. Um, switching gears a little bit, our next question is about the pandemic, which has obviously impacted all of our lives in a pretty significant way. So how specifically has COVID affected your work and how have you had to do things differently? We can start with Joe. Uh, so in, in the field I work in, it basically, we don't really have the option of uh, working from home. Uh, we're pretty much still have to go to the office every day. Um, just it's the nature of the job. Um, so it basically, it's just meant uh, wearing masks at work and, and trying to stay away from people whenever you can. <laughs> um, but other than that, it hasn't it hasn't changed a whole lot really, um, just since we have to be in the office. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, I think I'm at a point in my career where I don't need to be in the office every day. I'm there about once a week, um, but I do a lot of my work remotely um, just because I'm at a kind of, I work with a lot of executives at this point. So this is my office. You're looking at it right now. Thank you. Jessica? Yeah, I'd echo what uh, Joe was saying. I, I work pretty hands-on uh, on the vehicle, so it's really hard for me to work from home. Um, yeah, so I, I'm really lucky in that uh, Rivian, I, I get tested regularly um, and I have to wear a mask at work. Um, and we try to be smart also outside of work, making sure that, you know, we're, we're staying at home, at home uh, for the most part outside of work so that um, we're trying to keep other employees safe. Um, and then the other thing I'd say, uh, it's really been a motivating thing, especially working at this company that's working on a vehicle that's meant to be used outdoors like I think a lot of people are kind of having outdoor adventures because um, those are the most those I guess are the safest if you're outside and um, so it's been kind of motivating here uh, because we're working on a product that really people could use right now um, so it's been pretty rewarding. Thank you engineers always seem to be at the forefront of our problems. Um, Benidra? Um, I have to um, say that I'm kind of dual. I can do my work inside and outside. And just like Jessica was mentioning about outdoor adventures, I've taken, I would say I've taken the very nicest days in the area to get out to a construction site and put on my hard hat and my steel toe boots and like truck or track that one mile into the woods to look at that one pipe to see, you know, so it has, I've had a chance to um, fortunately get out and into nature and, and do and explore different aspects of my business because um, I'm lucky to work uh, with outdoor uh, type of things. I'm, I'm not restricted to the office. I have been taking my meetings um, remotely of via telework, but when it comes to sites and site visits, you know, it's easy for me to be safe. Um, I mentioned flying drones and stuff. This was a really great time to get a little more experience and a, little, a few more flight hours in uh, to test um, drones and to test heights and available and just uh, scopes and pictures and uh, video and stuff like that when it became time for us to be outside. So I think I've been able to collaborate more outside and I've enjoyed the opportunity to be out, like Jessica said, in the outdoors. Thank you. Yeah, I know engineering is a very hands-on career, so I'm glad it has provided you with some of the flexibility to either do it virtually if you can or in person like Joe. Um, but our next question, Joe, I know you mentioned specifically that there are many internship opportunities for students in high school, but how can students actually find and secure these kinds of internships? Great question. Um, so I, I would say look on the, uh, the, the actually look on like the careers page of some of the companies in your area. Um, they probably list uh, internships as like high school internships um, on on just their regular careers page. Um, but also if there's, you know, if there's a company in your area that you think would be interesting to work for, um, you know, you might try, if they're like a smaller company, you might try just uh, calling them up or, 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 you know, sending them an email uh, about it and, and ask them if they, even if they don't have anything listed, um, you know, 
high school internship might not actually pay anything, but if you offer to just come in and help out every once in a while, um, in exchange for basically learning how engineers work every day, um, you might be able to, to learn something that way or find, find something that way. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add on that subject? I think a lot of your career ends up being your network. So, you know, talk to your, your parents, your parents, friends, your, your friends, parents, let them know what you're interested in. Um, you know, my biggest career advice is always ask, um, because people don't know what you're looking for unless you ask. Um, so I know I got some of my first internships because, you know, the guy across the street, uh, worked at the power grid. So I worked at the power grid for a summer. Um, and, and that was really interesting to see. So yeah, talk to your neighbors and your friends. And to yeah, our students, and piggy well. sorry to go ahead. ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, just piggy, piggybacking off of that as well. Like, even if your parents or, uh, your neighbors aren't necessarily in the engineering field or even in another industry, like ask your teachers, like, um, your teachers are also a, a resource for you. Um, yeah, make sure you do well in their classes and then ask. <laughs> Yes. Speaking of teachers, I just wanted to plug counselors as well, too. Um, your counselors have a database of internships that are available to them. So for students watching, um, please make sure you do reach out to your, to your counselors to ask about those engineering opportunities. And, um, you, know, you know, as an engineer, you guys have talked a lot about getting to work in teams, having people who support you and all of that. So how often do you socialize with others and versus how often do you work alone, alone on a project? What's that kind of balance? Um, is it more of a social job? Is it more of an independent job? Um, Melissa, why don't we begin with you? I see the majority of my work is social. I'm in meetings. Um, we're collaborating on things, uh, working on, you know, the projects together. Um, earlier in my career, I probably had more independent time um, where I was off responsible for a certain element and then had to come back and integrate it with a group. Um, but yeah, that, I'd say it's probably probably 70% uh, collaboration time and 30% on my own. How about you, Vinidra? For me, I think it's the same as Melissa. Early on, I had very specific tasks to complete. I would have to write a report. I was responsible for the report, gathering all the data points um, and compiling all the data together and then presenting it. But now it's turned into more 70% of the social part because now I have to explain what I wrote and how, why, how, why it's important and um, make it make sense. Basically, it's the other persons that will make decisions off of what I've written or what I found or what my investigation has uncovered. So um, I would say 70% social and 30% personal or, or independent. That's cool. And you mentioned having to explain what, um, you have, what you did to other people. And Joe, you kind of talked about that, that presentation aspect. So for you, what's that kind of balance between social and personal work? Yeah, I'd say maybe something like 50 50 um you know there's there's some things I, I work on by myself but ultimately it's in support of somebody else um so even if i'm doing a task uh you know maybe i have to you know come up with a solution for somebody but then i'm gonna have to explain it to them and so they can go and implement it um and and yeah you know implement the fix that i've, I've proposed um so it's, it's a it's a mix yeah, certainly. And the the comment about you know like the more like the higher up you get, the the less you do by yourself. Um, when you start out in engineering, it's it's more of like a hey you new guy do this, um, and then later on that you end up being the person saying hey guy new guy go do this. So um, it it kind of tapers down. I see. And what about you, Jessica? Yeah, I'd say my work is probably like ninety five percent social. I'm working with people all the time. Um, uh, yeah, I, I essentially work in a shop. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I tend to be putting out fires if, if, uh, well, not literal fires, but, uh, yeah, working with people and trying to solve problems on the car every day. So I have to work with the designers and the technicians and, um, kind of everybody working around the car at the same time. So that's pretty cool. 
Yeah, I think, Jessica, that's something really neat about your job at like a small kind of startup feel is you're you're going to get a lot of experience about a, a lot of different things at the beginning versus sometimes, you know, at a bigger company, you're given a small piece of a big puzzle versus you're kind of exposed to the whole thing right at the beginning, which is really cool. Yeah, and I've definitely had to wear a bunch of different hats. Like, um, I have one job title, <laughs> but I do a lot of different things. Um yeah, so that's actually been really cool about working at a startup. It's like uh, I have to play a bunch of different roles um, within different teams, which has been really cool. And go ahead, Benidra. So that kind of just goes to show maybe don't, you know, look down upon small beginnings or small companies because you can maybe take away or have the greatest amount of versatility when it comes to your career and um, some of your projects and some of your interactions. So it's important to keep your eyes open and not just dis discount small, smaller companies. And it's you know awesome that you guys are talking about you know your be those beginnings um, and regardless of where you start off and a lot of students are actually asking from YouTube what was your first year after graduating college like and when you guys were finding a job in uh, your career and students are also asking what was that salary range especially when you guys were first starting and beginning in the engineering field uh, Jessica you're a recent college graduate let's start off with you oh no that's a tough question yeah I um so uh, I ended up. Uh, so my senior year of college, I had a couple offers from a couple of different companies that were bigger, um, and I, I really wanted something that was like pretty fast paced. Um, so I actually declined those offers, and then I had this period where I didn't really know what I was going to do after school, um, which was very stressful. And then uh, I applied and went through the interview process at Rivian, and then started basically like two weeks after my finals. Um, so I, yeah, I kind of had the option to work at, at a bigger company, um, at a bigger automotive company, and I uh, made the kind of scary and risky decision to, to not do that and to try to get something that would be a little bit faster paced. Um, yeah, so I, I ended up at Rivian. Um, yeah. I say that's great that that worked out for you, and I'm glad that you stuck to your gut. I think that's really good advice for a lot of uh, students watching to make sure that you know you know what type of environment you work in best. So, um, picking a job or finding a company that'll best cater to that. Um, how about you, Joe? Uh, yeah, so I, I was pretty lucky. So the the aerospace industry generally recruits uh, in like the fall fall semester of your senior year. They're, they do a lot of heavy recruiting in that time period, and I was able to. Basically, I had a job secured um, before Christmas. Um, so bef before Christmas of my senior year of college, I, I had a job lined up. Um, so that was pretty great. Um, it took a lot of the, the stress off that last last semester of college, <laughs> um, which is good. And that was right, like that 2009 downturn of like the world. Um, so that was nice. Um, as far as the salary question goes, everybody always wants to know about salaries. <laughs> um, I'd say in aerospace anyway, you can probably look at between 70 and 90,000 coming out of college with a, a bachelor's depending on the job and where. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a range that, and geography matters on what your salary is going to be. So uh, less expensive places are going to have uh, lower starting salaries, but it's all kind of cost of living adjusted. For sure. And I'm glad that um, different companies do that recruiting during while you're in college. So, you know, I'm glad that they came to your campus and those opportunities are available for students who are watching. I know a lot of people thinking about the future and how they're going to find jobs. They don't know exactly how to, how to reach out to these companies. So it's good to hear that companies um, do some of that reaching out to students. Um, what about you, Melissa? Yeah, uh, more similar to Joe. Um, I was at a different point of a downturn of the economy. I was coming out in like 2001, 2002. So the tech bubble had just burst. Um, so going to the big companies was um, definitely attractive. Um, and I had my job secured, I think, by early uh, spring, kind of late winter of my uh, senior year of college um, salary that long ago is completely irrelevant. Um, but you can look up salaries uh, on uh, sites like Glassdoor, if you just want to kind of understand uh, what people make in your area. And like Joe said, it depends on, 
you know, you're going to get paid more if the cost of living in like DC or Boston or San Francisco is higher than uh, if you go to a less expensive area. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Glassdoor. I know that's a really good resource for kind of looking up what different careers are and um, what different requirements for certain careers are. And it gives students a good idea of what skill sets they should try to develop if they're looking into different fields. And how about you, Vinidra? So like Melissa mentioned, I came out uh, maybe at an economic downturn per se. And so um, the areas and the locations that I were interested in securing uh, employment opportunities were not attractive and they weren't recruiting as heavily as um, as they are now per se. And so um, I actually found myself, I'm the reluctant engineer. I did not think if you would have asked me 20 years ago, would I be, what would I be doing? I definitely wouldn't have said an engineer, right? So um, with that being said, I kind of out of school reverted back to another uh, industry that I worked. I worked in hospitality. And then, um, and so that hospitality actually gave me a little bit of a network. I started connecting with engineers and environmental engineers that will come to um, Tallahassee is the capital of Florida. And so they did a lot of legislation there and so on and so forth. So I started connecting with more people on the environmental side, even in that other career. And they kind of, uh, I thought it was cool, some of the things that they were saying and some of the things they were advocating for. And so that kind of renewed my my interest in environmental and the environmental film and the environmental world. So um, my first job coming out was at a small environmental engineering firm in Rockville, Maryland, um, that was headed by a uh, African-American engineering woman that I had never met before. And those were few and far between for me and my world. And for her to just take me under my under her wing and expose me to uh, the the total facet of engineering um, in multiple cities and multiple states. And so I was just interested in her projects and uh, what came from that. But I'm the reluctant engineer maybe on the panel. I didn't know coming out that, yeah, this is for me. Let me go for it. It just, you know, it worked itself out for me. That's great to hear that even if you don't go into college planning to be an engineer, you know, there's always the opportunity to find your path um, we received another really interesting question from YouTube, and it is, how can art be involved in a career in engineering? So could you start us off with that one, Jessica? Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, so actually one of the things that I did um, after, uh, I guess, between my sophomore and junior year of college was I worked for uh, Girls Who Code, so I was a, a programming instructor. And we did like a whole unit on like kind of how programmers need to be creative and use that, um, use art or use, um, yeah, use like your artistic mindset to um, help you be a better programmer. And um, one of the things that we did was kind of explore the way um, that you can make art through programming and through graphics and um, web design and how, uh, yeah, you can do kind of um, digital art using your programming skill set. Um, and especially in the automotive industry, like cars have to look nice. Um, and people want uh, the leathers to be nice and luxurious and um, like the outline of the car to be pretty. Um, so we have a lot of people that work on the car and, and how that looks. And um, I definitely shouldn't be the person to do that for the car because I don't kind of have that mindset. Um, so you definitely need some artistic people um, and that kind of creative, more creative uh, artistic mindset. Thank you. Melissa? Yeah, I, I kind of think of the biotech space and art right now. There's a lot of people using biology to make artwork, um, whether they're growing the artwork or using fluorescence um, in a specific pattern. Uh, so there's this whole art and bio movement happening kind of right alongside uh, what's happening in biotech. And I kind of met, forgot to mention earlier when I was TAing just a couple of years ago for my PhD, I think in bioengineering, it was almost 50-50 female, um, which is kind of more consistent with biology in general, uh, but really exciting to see. Um, and certainly even in my PhD class, it was nearly 50-50. So that is really neat with that new engineering field kind of coming up. You're definitely getting a lot more diversity of interest. Thank you. It seems to be that creativity is an essential part of engineering. Um, does anyone else have anything to add to this question? 
All right. If not, we can move on to the next one. So this is also a question from YouTube, and it is, what are some best practices to help prevent mistakes on the job? And are mistakes always a bad thing? And Joe, could you start us off? Uh, so I'd say they're not they're not always a bad they're not always a bad thing. Um, there's a, there's a saying out there, certainly in the startup world, fail early, fail often. Um, you learn a lot from failure. Uh, if you if you build something and it works perfect the first time, um, you know maybe you did your job right, maybe you got lucky. Uh, if if you know when you're when you get things wrong, when things don't go right, um, you learn a lot, right? You get to learn about why it didn't go right. What what did, what can you do better next time? Um, so making mistakes is is not not necessarily a bad thing, um, but you also don't want to make them all the time, right? So you also want to have some some engineering rigor in what you're doing. So uh, the peer review process is a great way to uh, avoid that. So don't just you know do something and then release it to the world. Uh, you know, give it to your colleague and have them look it over to say make to make sure that you know you didn't mess anything up. Uh, that your assumptions are are valid. Uh, that you're going about things the right way. Uh, that's a that's probably the biggest way that we avoid mistakes in engineering is just having other people review our work and make sure we did it right. Thank you. How about you, Benidra? Uh, I agree with what Joe said. Um, I think that when you make a mistake, it's an opportunity and you can't always look at it as, oh man, you know, get down on yourself because you made a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. But when you're in a a uh, high profile or an engineering realm or engineering firm, you just want to make sure that you take the opportunity that that mistake has brought to you and, you know, learn from it. I think it's a continual learning process. So don't get down on yourself uh, for those mistakes. Just learn from them. Thank you. Yeah, it seems like learning doesn't stop in the classroom when you graduate from college. Um, you're lifelong learners. And I think we are switching gears a little bit and moving into our speed round questions. So only a few word answers. And our first question is, work-life balance is so, so, so important. So what activities or hobbies do you do to relax? I'll take and that one. I'm a, I'm a private pilot. I fly uh, airplanes and uh, more recently I've gotten into gliders. Yeah, I um I usually run and like to travel quite a bit. Uh, now I have a kid, so um, he is my outside of work activity at present. <laughs> when the world was open, I like to um, travel as well, just like um, Melissa mentioned. Um, and I'm also a little bit of a foodie, so um, I like culinary delights here and there. Yeah, and I. Uh... I just moved to California. It's a rainy day today, but um, yeah, when I have free time, I'll go to the beach and uh, relax a bit. Sounds like fun. So next question, tell us something about yourself that people would be surprised to know. Let's start off with you, Melissa. Um, I don't know, I guess maybe people would, I don't that's a tough question. Uh, I think uh, just that most people know I'm really passionate about biotech. Um, I guess maybe people don't know uh, kind of my background and, um, you know, that uh, I guess, you know, I've got four brothers and sisters and 12 nieces and nephews. Um, and that really influenced kind of how I grew up and, and how I act in the workplace. Sure. What about you, Joe? Yeah. Sounds like Jessica had something. Go ahead, Jessica. <laughs> gives, gives you more time to think of what <laughs> Um Yeah, I, uh, uh, I'd i say, especially at work, my, this, I guess this really isn't a fun fact about me, but um, my grandpa uh, was an engineer for the Navy, um, and he worked on some of the first kind of internet protocol um, when he was working. So now I'm at work and kind of using his same system that he developed. Um, so people at work, I, sometimes I'll tell them that my grandpa used to work on the, the ARPANET and they're all like, what? That's nuts. That's crazy. It's in your blood. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's pretty cool. That is very cool. What about you, Joe? 
Uh, I'll go with I'm technically a nationally ranked rally driver, which is cool uh, for for road rally. It's neat. It sounds like fun. And Zanidra? All of a sudden, I feel not so interesting. Um, <laughs> I think people, uh, like my family, doesn't really understand what I do for a living. So I think it's kind of cool that I'm available to participate in this panel with you all. Um, because I, I feel like they don't realize that I deal with pee, poop, and paper all day. And um, kind of some of the systems around that. So I think that's pretty funny. Thank you all. So next up, we'd like to ask if there was a person in history you could meet, who would it be and why? And we can start off with Melissa. So my answer for this is always Lincoln. And I think it's really important today, um, someone that was looking to unify and that overcame obstacles. Um, so failed over and over and over and persisted. Um, certainly had a lot of tragedy in their life and, and still kind of made it through and was uh, a leader. So um, that's want to learn more about how you persist through all those challenges. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, yeah, I'd say Ada Lovelace. She was um, she was the first uh, programmer, uh, and she happened to also be a woman. Uh, and there was kind of some juicy drama about uh, some people that kind of stole her work and, and called it their own. So um, yeah, I'd like to talk to her. So that would be very cool, interesting conversation. Thank you, Joe. I'd really like to meet the Wright brothers. That would have been neat talk to them about how they got the idea to start working on airplanes. And Benitra? Um, I think for me, historically, uh, I've looked up to Rosa Parks. You know, she was a woman. She had a voice. She stood her ground. And um, kind of what came after that kind of influenced the rest of history. And, you know, she that was in Montgomery, and I'm from Alabama. So I think that's pretty cool. For sure. Our next question, how have you used social media and online platforms in your work? Melissa, let's start with you. Yeah, I don't use social media in a lot of my work, but I do some volunteer work. Um, so I tend to use uh, social media to promote uh, the organization that I'm a part of. Um, and then when I do need help on something, I do a lot of Googling um, to understand kind of deeper concepts. Uh, Google, Google Scholar has been a huge help um, to get kind of better deep technical knowledge when I need it. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, I'll use social media, um, like mostly LinkedIn on a professional, uh, in a professional setting. So I'll, um, yeah, I, I keep my LinkedIn up to date and uh, connect with all the people at my work uh, and connect with people that would be cool to work with. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I use social media. Awesome. And Joe? Uh, yeah, similar to Melissa. I don't really use it for for work uh, at all. Um, generally, we try to keep, keep work and social media separated. Um, but uh, LinkedIn is, is a useful resource for, for finding new jobs, uh, certainly. Thank you. And Benidra? Um, again, same with maybe Joe and Melissa. I don't have to use social media. Um, we do have a comms team, a communications department that kind of deals with those. But if a customer has an issue and they tweet or tag um, WSC, I may be behind the scenes answering a question or um, a concern that a customer may have had from a tweet. Thank you. We are nearing the end of our time together, so let me ask this one final question to our guests. What advice do you have for students wanting to pursue a career in engineering? And Joe, could you take that one first? Yeah, I would say uh, just stay curious about the world around you. Uh, it's it's an interesting place, and how stuff works is is always fascinating. So just keep keep being curious about how everything how everything works around you. How about you, Benidra? Um, I'd say understand using your hands and the power of doing things with your hands and develop a lot of your communication skills and presentation skills like um, Joe's mentioned before as well uh, and learn how to collaborate on a team and uh, those skills will take you anywhere. Jessica? Yeah, I'd say if you want to get into engineering, I think engineering school can be kind of tough. Um, and that's kind of the point of it. So um, some of it is really hard. And, and uh, knowing that you can um, 
you can work hard and work with your classmates and, and figure things out. Uh, and yeah, stick with it. And our final comment, Melissa. I'll echo what Jessica said. Don't let one bad grade, whether it's a test or a semester or a year, get you down. I think I got a C on every single first math test I've ever taken. Um, and I made it through. Um, just keep your eye on what you want to do um, and focus, you know, beyond that that small setback. Wonderful. And thank you all for your time today. And thank you to all of the students who submitted questions. Um, coming into this, I really had no idea what engineering entailed or what the field of engineering actually was. So I think I've actually gained so much insight and I've really appreciated hearing your stories and your advice and your dedication to engineering. It definitely seems like a very cool, constantly growing, constantly changing field. So thank you for sharing that insight with all of us. Um, for students interested in learning about MCPS career readiness programs, visit the website on the screen. MCPS offers a number of programs that provide students real-world learning experiences, college credit, and even industry certifications. And thank you all to the students who tuned in today. Let's show on the screen now the QR code and a bit.ly address. Both the QR code and the link will take you to a survey where you can provide us feedback about today's show and future programs. The bit.ly address is bit.ly slash let's talk career survey please take the time to share your thoughts and ideas with us. Thank you. And check out our website, www.mcpsletstalkcareers.org to watch past episodes and learn about career readiness programs that MCPS has to offer to students. Coming up on Wednesday, April 28th at 10 a.m., the next Let's Talk Careers session will focus on healthcare and community health and feature speakers from the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services, Care for Your Health, and Kaiser Permanente. That's going to be an amazing discussion. That's all for today. This is Nick. And Helena signing off. Bye.